So hello and a good afternoon. I welcome you to today's Trading Spotlight webinar here on Friday, the 28th of February, 2020. Um, my name is Jens Slatan and I am, uh, yeah, I, I'm the moderator for the upcoming, well, 45 minutes, I think. Uh, and uh, today we have a very, very interesting topic. Um, the question on how to trade institutional levels. By the way, I just checked the check box, uh, chat box and uh, I saw um, there's also one uh, um, um, attendee here from Edmonton, Canada. So in this case, yes, it's good morning. So it's an international webinar. Probably we have also some guys here from Australia. Uh, so then it's um, um, good evening or good night, probably. It's, I think it's 10, 10 hours right now. I'm not sure. <coughs> but however, so um, I hope that, that you will enjoy uh, the upcoming 45 minutes. And uh, yeah, we have a, in, in fact, very, very interesting um, uh, topic here. I prepared something which is probably of interest here, um, has to do with institutional levels still something we could also use for our trading. Uh, but um, and then in a few minutes, um, more details on that then. Um, so today's agenda, let's have a look here. It's uh, the question on the key differences between institutional and retail traders. That's what we want to point out. What are institutional levels? How can traders determine these correctly? And then also how to profit from the knowledge around institutional levels um, in, your, in your trading. Um, so yeah, my name is Jens, so <laughs> I, I already said this. Um, what's probably um, the most interesting thing about me is that I'm located in Berlin in Germany. Um, all other details can be found um, in an interview I gave um, um, or I did together with, with Amra Markets um, around last year in June, July. So what's my background? Where do I come from? And everything. Uh, and yeah, so that's probably um, something we, we want to, to um, uh, postpone, <laughs> respectively, probably uh, discuss a little later on in the, in the Q&A. Um, what's probably of more interest and more important is uh, to introduce Admiral Markets to you. Most of you will will know the broker already, but um, Admiral Markets is the is the broker who makes all this here possible. Um, <clears throat> has offices around the globe in twenty and more countries. Um, Australia is, by the way, one of these um, locations here where um, um, Admiral is ASIC li uh, licensed. We also have an office um, of Admiral Markets in in Berlin, in Germany. So it's something like 30 minutes or so here um, uh, from my my office up to or down to to um, Admiral then. So if I have any questions, um, I can easily go there. Why is this of importance? Probably especially when it comes to trading. Um, you like to have someone who speaks your language. Once you have a question on whatever topic, it might be on a trade, it might be on an execution of a trade, it might be on a service, on a webinar, whatever. Um, and uh, so this is definitely something you should take into account when uh, deciding which broker you should trade with beside very competitive um, uh, conditions, um, uh, cheap commissions or respectively low spreads, ultra tight spreads, you can say. All this is something you can find at Admiral Markets. So admiralmarkets.com, uh, feel free to check out the website for further details. And um, there's also the chance, if you're watching this right now here on YouTube, um, to click on the tab, um, on uh, webinars, education webinars, and there you can register here for this um, Trading Spotlight webinar. So if you want to ask questions, sure, you can ask also uh, these questions um, um, below here uh, in a YouTube video. If you look at um, or if you watch this on YouTube right now, still probably better if you have the question right here to ask it here within the uh, webinar. So let's have a look now at the, today's topic and the key differences here between institutional and retail traders. Uh, what I did here in this, um, uh, um, um, or to answer this question is I prepared a table and we want to um, go through this uh, um, or through through the through the um, uh, three points here I consider to be of um, the highest interest and the, the highest importance in fact into institutional traders and retail traders um, so I, I um, made here one point it's available capital uh, usually institutionals are trading millions to billions. Um, if it's a money manager, for example, and we are talking about asset under management in this case. So this is usually not the region within a retail trader finds itself. So most likely a retail trader has uh, an account size and average between five to 10,000. Um, based on my experience within this industry, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's usually what you, what you um, um, 
expect a retail trader to have respectively where uh, within which range you can you can find him surely there will be some retail traders um, who trade up to six figure accounts like 100,000 some probably half a million there's probably also guys trading millions uh, within their accounts, but usually it's an average between five to ten thousand. Um, so this is the first thing which is of interest because this um, affects your time horizon, which you're looking at. Because um, here we can we can we can probably sum this up. When you're trading um, a retail or when you're a retail trader, uh, this is in fact something which is um, well. I I usually say. It's, uh, it's an advantage. Why? Because it's like um, you're in stealth mode. So no one really knows that you're there. So certainly people know that you're there, but all in all, um, we can say that um, usually you can enter and exit the market whenever you want. You don't need to, to accumulate um, pieces, especially to when trading, for example, equities. Usually in FX, it's uh, um, um, a complete different topic because in FX, you have a market depth um, and and, and um, um, which which goes up to the average um, average volume per day uh, traded in uh, according to the vis in uh, the FX market I think is between five to six trillion US dollar per day average daily volume so market debt here um, is, is not really an issue still um, if you're an institutional trader you just can't um, enter the market whenever you want um, because it's it's like um, you you have to to um, go into the market step by step by step if you want to buy a bigger larger build a larger position let's say new USD um, even though that's probably easier and um, the cost of doing business here or the cost of trading is uh, not very high compared to let's say emergency currency pairs like if you want to trade what can we say here euro against um hungarian foreign or something like that i mean usually here you have you have wider spreads higher cost of doing business and you need someone who's also willing to sell or respectively to buy from you here so this is something which is um, um very very important and it also becomes clear then that the time horizon usually from institutionals is most of the time especially when it comes to global micro players long term while retail traders focus on intraday trading especially intraday trading since they can enter exit the market whenever they want so this is a key difference and then there's also something very interesting resulting out of this uh, when it comes to risk management uh, so probably you have heard this um, and it's um, in fact it's true and i want to give you in a few seconds minutes i want to give you an idea on how um, institutional traders calculate their risk and also how they manage their positions then. Um, this is probably especially true when currently looking at uh, the market environment in which we find ourselves. And so you can draw very interesting conclusions out of this. You probably have seen it's, um, it's a complete sell-off, um, risk off everywhere. Um, 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 US 10-year treasury yields are dropping like a stone to new all-time lows. Coronavirus fears everywhere. Um, and there's also huge selling and equities taking place right now. And one of the reasons uh, is that, um, or not one of the reasons, but a driver lower here, um, you can find in the um, uh, um, in, in the aspect how institutional traders uh, manage their risk in their trading. So in our case, when we are looking at a retail trader, we usually have a stop loss. That means like you open the position and then you um, identify a level wherever that you place your stop and then we take it from there. Um, <clears throat> in case of an institutional trader, this is not necessarily the case. So I already mentioned it. We have an available capital here of millions to billions, um, which means you do not place, let's, let's assume, let's just give a number here. Um, let's say you have a, you have a, um, a position Euro USD, like 10 billion Euro USD long or something like that. Um, and then you don't place a stop here at um, whatever level and say, okay, I'm willing to sell my position here with 10 billion. Because the problem is if you dump such a huge position into the market, that will result in you having trouble to get a good price because slippage will become a topic so the, the the price you will receive is usually worse than the one you wanted to have which will, which means nothing more than the cost of trading is rising um, and also institutional traders should be considered as a business um, or institutional trading is a business and so you want to keep your cost of doing business as low as possible and um, that's one of the reasons why institutional traders tend to um, manage their risk with something 
we know as value at risk, respectively, multi-asset diversification. So that's there's a gray area, let's say. It's, it's um, going hand in, uh, hand in hand here. Um, but I don't want to leave it here uh, with value at risk, but I want to give you a better idea on what this is. Um, and therefore, I created something. You probably have um, uh, seen our, let me just go here. You have probably seen that I um, uh, am do in within our Traders Yard community. So here, you can find daily setups from my end, fully automated, in fact. Um, you can find two, one on the DAX, one on the S&P every day. And it's not only that I give those um, I'm trading ideas away here, but what I also do is I tend to, or not I tend to, but I track these uh, trades, in fact. So um, we have a statement here. So currently, we are, it's not that much. We, we, we have been more than 10% underwater. Um, and it's purely basic strategy. So it's open range breakout within the DAX, within the S&P. And we are not talking about performance. But one of the main reasons was that I have a chance to use real data here to present it within such webinars as we have it right now so that you can get a better idea on how to use this data if you collected it, um, um, how to use it then within your trading. So there's the performance that you see it. It's 50-50 nearly, so one trade per day um, in the DAX, respectively in the S&P 500, depending on whether the range width is wide enough and all this. So now, FX Blue, um, this is the website we use here to track this, gives us a chance to um, calculate our risk, or there's a risk tap, in fact. So here, the risk of ruin currently is 100% because we are below water. So currently, we have a negative expectancy. So that's why this is completely red here. Um, but this is of higher interest here. There's the spread of historic returns. Um, and within this, there is now a chance. And you can already, um, if you're very, very good at math, um, you can probably guess where the um, overall risk of uh, value at risk is here. But what I did now was I used the data I collected here. You can um, uh, download this Excel file with all trades being made within the time span we are looking at here. So all trades are collected on FX Blue, and then we download the Excel file. And what I did is I manipulated this Excel file a little. So manipulating in regards to, I made it um, useful for our purpose here. And then I um, programmed something in uh, Python. It's um, to, to give you an idea, the value at risk, I calculated it. So to just give you an idea, so here I have the um, 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 Excel file. I called it, or I named it um, VR, VAR for value at risk. And then I here, brought it into this form. And you can see it here, there's the net profit, each trade, in fact. So these are the last five trades, by the way. So um, to just give you an idea of what it is. Um, there, we have, <clears throat> there we have the balance, I'm sorry. <clears throat> there we have the balance, um, which is going, or which is one to one the same as the balance we currently have here in our account. So this is the, again, last trade. So this is the balance, 9814.67. <clears throat> And then you can see here, there's one trade open, which I um, cut it out for, the, for this purpose here. Um, and so then what I do is, in fact, I, I um, calculate here the return um, each trade has, which is no big surprise that it ranges somewhere in a range between, uh, oh no, it, it depends on, if you're working with a, um, a predefined take profit, then the um, a take profit or the, the, the performance you can expect is certainly given. But in case of the S&P, we do not have this. So if you have a strong trend like we had the last days, then you could have returns up to like something like four or 5% per day in fact. So, but what, what um, um, is of interest for us here is now I have the percentage sign. And then what I do is I can calculate this um, um, so-called standard uh, deviation in this case. So uh, there's a normal dis distribution of the returns I do here. In fact, this is not the same. It does not look the same, even though it's the same data as we have here. So what we did so far is I, I re mm, rebuilt, let's say, what is already given here on FX Blue. But here in this case, we look at daily returns. This is the same we do here too, but the problem is that um, daily returns means they combine the S&P and the DAX trade. In my case, 
I have each separate um, uh, separated here. So it's one DAX, it's one um, S&P trade. So that's why this looks a little different, but this is not of interest for us in fact. So this is just playing around a little, give you a picture, everything's fine. But what's of higher interest is this here. You can now use all this data here and calculate the so-called VR, VAR, um, 90, for example. So this means, um, to translate this, that means nothing more than how likely is it, or uh, no, with a 90% likelihood, so this is the so-called so confidence level. Um, so with a 90% probability, you have per trade a value at risk here, um, or you, you have a performance, a return of 1.2%. So this is, in fact, not so surprising. If you're risking something like, let's say, 1 to 1.5%, then usually you should expect the value risk to be within this range. Um, and there's also now 95% and there's also 99%. <clears throat> so you can, as you, as you can see here, so with some programming skills, you can easily calculate this value at risk. Why is this of interest now? And what has this to do with institutional levels? So. When you're looking at 95%, for example, that means you can expect here in this case, the return per trade to be within a range of, uh, or no, um, um, with a 95% likelihood to be 1.5% minus. This is what you risk per trade. Again, this is no big surprise. So now what you could do, and therefore you can also play around a little with, with data from let's say Yahoo Finance or something like that, um, you can now see the daily returns of, um, for example, shares like Apple or Yahoo, whatever. <clears throat> and then you can say, okay, I am not interested in the daily returns, but I'm interested in the monthly returns and this for a lo very long period of time. And then you can say, okay, if I have, let's say, a value at risk in this case um, um, of, of, let's say, 5% or so um, here, so there's then minus 0 0.05, um, then it means that in one out of 20 months, you can expect from a purely statistic given standpoint and given historic data, you can expect um, the share to drop 5% or more than that. Okay, so, and why do institutionals use this? Well, they built a portfolio now with several shares, for example, and then they calculate this value at risk here. And given that, they then look at um, what are we willing to lose here per position, let's say, um, or let's put it more directly on an investor, let's say, even though this is not, not common, but let's assume you're an investor and you say right at the start when you invest your, let's say, 5 million, which this, this institutional fund, whatever, is, is trading for you, you say, I'm, I'm willing to lose maximum 10% per month. This is what I'm, what I'm willing to lose. And um, that said, they say, okay, with 95% chance, we can now say, okay, in one out of 20 months, you will reach this level given this um, 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 portfolio um, and, 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 or, or this, this portfolio mix and the position size and everything. Um, and once we reach this level or once we head towards this level, we formulate an algorithm which reduces the position size accordingly so that we do not reach this threshold which was given from you as an investor when you invested your money with us. So this is also something which is of interest when it comes to sell-offs like we've seen now in the last days or over the last days. So for example, there are CTAs, um, so come, um, um, uh, commodity trading advisors, hedge funds, for example, whatever. So they are actively trading the markets also from an intraday perspective. And they say, well, we have given risk parameters and given the historic returns, we calculate here our value at risk. And then based on that, we decide when to enter respectively, when to exit the market and reduce the position size accordingly so that we keep on trading within these parameters, which are given from a risk management perspective. So this is how, in fact, institutional ca calculate their risk and also um, 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 yeah, reduce respectively, build their positions accordingly to these given risk parameters. And this is how you can understand then value at risk. So multi-asset diversification now means that you have not just one asset within your portfolio, but you have several of these. Um, and then you can calculate the value at risk. And based on that, you can decide when to drop certain position, for example. So um, you can, mm, let me just think, 
No, okay, just we, we skip this. We don't want to overcomplicate things here. But just to give you an idea on how this is calculated. So they are not placing a stop loss here, but they calculate based on the historic returns and what they could expect here. Um, they calculate um, 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 probabilities that certain ranges are not um, 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 hit. And if these levels are hit, respectively, if the market drops further, in the long only portfolio, for example, they have to start to reduce the position to keep um, their risk management um, 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 accordingly and in place. Um, and this, by the way, also something which um, led to major um, um, problems during the, um, during the financial crisis because working with the value at risk here is difficult um, due to the fact that it's um, um, assuming that we're talking about efficient markets, if you want, or that there's no such thing as fat tails, which is not the case anymore. So these, um, 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 th this way of, of calculating your risk has flaws and is something which needs further con consideration. But for our purpose here, this is completely fine. So just to give you an idea. So now... <clears throat> We want to look at what are institutional levels. So um, how do positions are built in case of an institutional player? Um, probably have found yourself from time to time in a, in a, in a moment where you, where, you, where you said, well, um, I have the feeling that my stop was fished. So the market squeezes higher. <coughs> Sorry. Squeezes higher. One second, please. You are in a short position getting stopped out, afterwards the markets drops. Um, the only problem is, as we found out now in the slide before, um, the, the, the average trading size of a retail trader is not big enough that an institutional who is trading millions to billions um, is, 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 um, um, is, is really cares about, let's say you're one lot, your USD, you might be short or something like that. But what they certainly do is they look at levels where volume, liquidity, respectively depth is given so that they can execute their bigger orders. So it's not that they're hunting your stop, but what they try to do is they're hunting groups of stops. Because if you have not only one lot, but if you have, let's say, 1,000 guys with one lot, then we're, um, um, we start to trade about serious volume here which is given at a, at a certain level, which means then, okay, this is getting of interest for institutional traders. So they are looking at significant levels within the chart, um, assume that these are the regions where you have um, um, plenty of stops being placed from retail traders, for example, and then they try to execute their large blocks, their large orders here against these levels here um, because they need volume, liquidity, depth, to execute these, these um, 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 orders. So, which means then that the market tends to fake out in one direction and then moves after it um, um, stopped out or, or it went for uh, or hunted these groups of stops, it goes into that direction and then goes in the direction it was initially planned to, to drive the market or it should have been driven. That's probably also something you have seen during uh, major news releases, like the non-farm payrolls, for example. You probably have seen that we have um, um, initial stints, which are completely the opposite of what you get to see afterwards then. And this is mainly due to the fact that the market is searching for volume liquidity depth, because this is what a market is there for at the end. So you try to uh, meet supply and demand here. And you try not just to meet supply and demand, but you try to meet supply and demand in a high volume. And this, or, or, or to, to make sure that, that um, um, high volumes are filled at a, at a fair price, which is in case given here. And this is, yeah, this is, this is one of the reasons why, why the market behaves sometimes um, in a way which we do not really appreciate and it looks like stop fishing then in this case. So what I have here now is, um, it's a, yeah, in fact, it's an, it's an example of, of, of stop fishing, in fact. So what I have here is dollar JPY. You might be um, uh, um, wondering when I took this chart, so it's probably a month ago or so. Um, once volatility was a little lower, look at current uh, the current uh, dollar JPY chart, you will see that we, we not only saw the market topping out here, but taking out this level, 
uh, pushing significantly higher up to 112 and now seeing a bounce back below 110 given all these um, developments around corona fears and risk off hitting the market yields us yields dropping something by the way we also mentioned during several um, um, technical uh, pieces which were published on the website from up the markets you can find these um, every week by the way every Monday and especially on dollar JPY every Friday. So today, just have a look there um, for further details. But what's of interest for us now is the examples of stop fishes here. So I've, um, I did the same, uh, I did the following. So now I have some, some circles here, which come in there. You can see it. For example, the market is moving higher to a level. This is a region of 109 that was in, yeah, it was June, July, August, 2019. Dollar JPY went for this level. You can see that this was uh, a former high here of the month. That's also something of interest. So you you, you carefully or or um, 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 here have a, have a look at the at the x axis in this case to see that this was the monthly high. But it was a high everyone can see. So let's put this a bit, little differently. Um, if someone asks me which are uh, what are the most important um, uh, chart patterns, for example, institutional traders look at? So I can say, based on my personal um, um, experience and also in the institutional world, so um, as you may have seen or as you may will read uh, within this interview I did together with Atma Markets, I started out as a trading assistant at a market maker of a, um, a stockbroker, quite big stockbroker here in Germany. Um, and uh, what, what we did was we met supply and demand, if you want. So this is what, that was our daily uh, um, a bread and butter business. So now the thing is that um, there were also sometimes some, some, uh, some discussions, um, um, talks between colleagues. And I had a situation um, so that was my, my first job in the financial industry, uh, in, in trading industry. So financially, it's not right because for, um, before I worked with a, with a bank. Um, uh, but this, this day, I, I can fully remember it. It was, um, it was shortly before the U.S. market opened. We were sitting together and um, I was back then um, studying everything I could get my hands on in regards to trading technical analysis, fundamental analysis, everything. So just to make sure that I know everything really well. Now we're sitting there and um, now the question um, arises, okay, what do you think about the DAX? Or what do we think about the DAX here? And um, I really well recall that um, there were several um, um, exchanges and someone said this way and the other way and blah, blah, blah. And then was the question, okay, let's ask our, our a greenhorn here. Let's ask Jens. So what do you think? And it was like, yes, well, I was like, um, have a look here. So, and then I, I, I showed my screen, I shared, shared my, my chart and I said, well, have a look here. So we have an inverse head and shoulder formation you can see here. So, um, and then I, I, I showed it exactly and the market had based on what I've learned so far within the, the big book um, on technical analysis I was currently studying, um, the market had to go up. So that was my conclusion. And then my senior trader came to me um, and she looked at me and then was like, okay, what did you just say? Head what? <laughs> I was like, head shoulder, inverse head shoulder. That's a, okay, head shoulder. So that's why the market goes up or down. You really think that? You believe that? Okay, good to know that. Okay, do you want a coffee? So because US markets are about to open. And so what I want to say, she was um, I'm a senior trader for over 20 years and uh, made plenty of money. Um, trading the markets professionally um, and didn't know what a head shoulder was, head shoulder formation or something, something which is very common to retail traders. Um, and the thing is now, uh, there are definitely levels um, which institutional players look at, but it's not the formations we are looking at here. The formations, um, if, if you want to trade them and if they work for you, fine, and go with it. It's definitely worth it because if they make sense, then um, it doesn't matter if you call it head shoulder or if you call it reverse whatever. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's all the same, in fact. It's, it's like you look at a chart and from a price action perspective, it needs to make sense. But still, when you're interested in which levels institutions look at, then you shouldn't overcomplicate things. What you should do is look at the pre-daily high and low. Look at the daily high, daily low from today. Look at the weekly high, weekly low. Look at the monthly high, monthly low. These are the levels institutionals look at. And um, <clears throat> in addition to that, certainly sometimes 
There's also then options coming into play and everything. But all in all, um, this is this is in fact how institutions look at markets. Um, they they don't overcomplicate things. They not printing or, or, or drawing any um, 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 colorful lines within the chart, something like that they don't really care about that. They just wonder, okay, where's the monthly high? In this case here, perfect example, this is the monthly high. Um, whatever was the reason, I mean, look at this candle, which happened there. I'm, I'm not really sure what happened there. Probably it was because of a, a news event hitting probably something on trade war, Donald Trump, probably some, some news releases, non from payrolls, I don't know. But what I can certainly see is that the market pushed to this level and even above that and then reversed sharply. So this is a daily chart, which means the market participants, um, the institutionals, which um, um, had a reason to believe that dollar JPY was about to push lower, um, they were looking for um, a way to build their short position. And therefore you need someone who's buying and who's buying here, those who place their stops within this region. So if you're already short position as a retail trader, you place your stop. And some of you, or we all, we all look for, for levels which are of relevance, in this case, the pre-monthly high in this case. So this is where we place our stop. And this is where institutionals find not only our stop, but every other stop too, a group of stops. And this is then why, how, they, how they go for or hunt the, the stops. So they, they look for build a short position, but therefore they need firstly to induce momentum or ignite momentum, push the market to and probably slightly above um, 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 an important threshold here on the upside in this case to build their position and then the market reverses from there because there's no further demand coming into the market. We can see this plenty of times. Um, one second, please. <coughs> you can also see this here, for example. So that was 105. You can see that was a flash crash which occurred at the beginning of 2019, for example. Everyone was looking for that level. Um, and we also see here, by the way, that was also the August low. So same it's the same play, the same game which is played here. So we are looking for um, a monthly low, respectively, in this case, also the yearly low. Everyone was looking at this. So probably there was some, some um, 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 yeah, differences because it was a flash crash and, and uh, some um, um, markets had this here slightly higher, slightly lower. But within this region, you could expect the yearly low to be and the focus of market participants to be at this certain level here in this case. So after the market spikes lower from here, there is aggressive momentum coming into the market given the, or driven mainly by demand, which um, or diminishing supply and higher demand um, for whatever reason, which drove prices higher from here. The same is also happening here. That was something we can uh, well remember. That was the um, day when uh, no further escalation in the uh, geopolitical tensions between the US and Iran this year, for example, um, uh, didn't manifest here. And there was no further reason to believe now that the market will um, um, push lower in addition to the expectation that probably markets currently are too, um, uh, too focused on the Fed really willing to cut rates within um, a year of a presidential election in the US. Right now, by the way, the um, likelihood here is over four, um, 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 uh, not over four, but it's nearly four, uh, four rate cuts. Market participants are expecting um, according to the Fed watch tool. But what you can see here is plenty of these um, occasions is uh, it's, it's relevant regions you can spot weeks before, in fact, because um, it's monthly highs, it's yearly lows in this case. It's also, again, a monthly low, which is which market participants are looking for here, uh, where institutionals here. And these are, um, yeah, classic examples of how the stop fishing works, respectively, how institutionals look for certain levels where they can um, uh, find a buyer, respectively a seller, to meet their needs, okay? So, when looking for a buyer, they want to sell, respectively, when they want to sell, uh, they want to buy, they are looking for a seller and vice versa. So, okay, now the question now is, um, how, do we, how do we profit from this? How can we, how can we uh, profit from it? I, to some extent, already said it, in fact, um, it's keep things as simple as possible. So don't overcomplicate things with trained, um, 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 I'm not, uh, 
charting patterns or something, but just identify significant support and resistance zone in the higher time frames. So um, even if you're looking only, or if you're trading an H4, or uh, I'm sorry, H4, um, um, MM15, let's say, you're trading uh, on a 50 minute time frame, I um, um, would say, have a look at the dominating time frames and not just your direct dominator, but also the dominator of your dominator. Um, what do I mean by that? Is if you're trading an M15, for example, a direct dominator can be found in the hourly chart in FX, um, <coughs> sorry, in the FX world, it's H4. Um, respectively, the H4, H1, H4 is dominated, directly dominated by the daily time frame. So if you can spot um, important levels here, you get already a good idea of the picture um, institutional traders uh, are, are currently looking at. Then you identify the significant highs and lows here, which are most likely pre-daily, pre-weekly, respectively pre-monthly highs and lows, and then you take it from there. Um, if you have an eye also on the economic calendar, that's also something which is very, very important. Um, you, should, you should always be aware of potential market moving events. And what I recommend doing is, um, if you, for example, let's, let's take the non-farm payrolls next week on Friday. What do you expect from the non-farm payrolls? So right now, I have not yet um, um, formulated my personal um, 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 schedule, respectively, my, um, my, my, my agenda, what I expect based on the current given fundamental developments. Probably it will be a non-event because most of um, uh, the trading and volatility will still be given by the coronavirus fear coronavirus fears, risk off and all this. But all in all, what I usually do is I write down my thoughts. What is the market expecting? Why are we right now in regards to this expectation? And then I look at the data set and I know for each scenario I formulated um, what I have to do when. So for example, um, I already said this. It's not uncommon that if X pair, let's take dollar JPY again, initially goes for a stop hunt and then reverses independently from the economic trend, even though sometimes this is even stronger. Um, because if you now say you know that dollar JPY is um, positively correlated to uh, US yields, for example, US yields are very positively cor um, um, correlated or connected, directly connected to the um, economic developments in the US in this case. So this means if US employment situation comes in better than expected, for example, you usually expect yields to take on positive momentum, bullish momentum, and then you also expect dollar JPY to follow 10 year yields and push higher too and vice versa. So if you expect this, if you know this, well then you should have a look at where can the buying um, demand or the, the, the demand from, from institutionals, where can they find sellers? Um, they usually find them somewhere lower, right? So where market participants who are already long have placed their stop, where there is a group of stops to be expected, which means the print comes in better than expected, the market pushes initially lower, triggering this group of stops here, stop fishing, we call this, and then the market takes on momentum from there. So um, that's something which, which is quite common in effect in, in FX trading, especially in FX trading. Um, what you therefore need to know is which um, um, currency pairs are usually positively correlated to yields. This is most of the time the case for dollar JPY. In precious metals, it's gold, for example. And then you have, you have to, to find out whether a news event is of significance or not. So by the way, um, next month we'll um, uh, have within the Trading Spotlight webinar, um, we, we have a look at the macros which are driving markets. So it's not necessary that we dig too deep into this topic right now, but um, just join the webinar we'll have in one or in two weeks. I'm not really sure when we have it, but I, I'm very sure because I prepared the um, um, presentation already that we have it in March on this topic. So yeah, and this is in fact um, how you can then understand the 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 all um, uh, the, the the price action effect. Probably that's some also probably an idea. Uh, probably we can or should have also more um, a live trading event probably around a big economic news event to probably make this make this a topic. Let me let me just think about this. Um, so let's now sum, sum this up. So there's no such indicator as institutional level. So it's not that you're now um, um, searching the web 
you, you type in institutional levels and then um, um, try to find an indicator you can use within your MT4, MT5, which displays you, um, uh, which displays you these, these levels, um, like pivot points, for example. But it's more like it's common sense to some extent. Uh, so institutional levels um, come naturally when looking at a chart. So it's simple support resistance analysis, if you want, knowing the pre-daily, weekly, monthly highs and the knowledge around market moving events as um, uh, in the ref respective ethics pair. And um, if, you, um, um, if, you, if you're aware of that, then you already have an idea what institutions are usually looking for, but don't expect them to, um, to really, to really um, 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 uh, act in the direction you expect them to act. Despite, oh, this is also something which is of interest. Probably I've seen that. It's not only that you have fake outs and the market is then strongly reversing, but it's also true that sometimes there's a strong break in one or the other direction. Why does this happen? Well, well, these market participants, they are looking for news events, especially in low volatile market environments. So currently this is not a big topic, but um, they are looking at um, uh, levels where they expect to find a buyer, respectively a seller or a group of buyers, a group of sellers to then um, find someone they can sell to, respectively they can buy from. The only problem is if the market um, is currently undecided in which direction to push and they are not yet positioned in a way uh, they have to be positioned um, to profit from a certain global macro um, um, move in one or the other direction, <coughs> They have to start to aggressively buy once the market breaks through or breaks above um, a certain threshold, a very so, um, important zone of support, respectively resistance, which then drives the price even lower because then they, um, they are forced to buy, respectively they are forced to sell. That's why, or that's how a dynamic comes into, into um, a currency pair after such a significant news event and also um, after after uh, the market breaking through a certain level on the up, respectively on the downside. So now the three key differences here between retail and institutional traders are available capital, time horizon, and how risk is managed. Um, and this explains how institutional traders think. For their trading, they need liquidity debt which they find in groups of stops. It's not that they go for your stop, but they go for groups of stops so that their demand, which is usually in the region around millions to billions, respectively their supply, uh, which is usually also millions to billions, can be, um, uh, can be, can be fulfilled. And um, afterwards, it looks like stop fishing, even though the only use, uh, they, they only use the most obvious reason um, where they can expect high volume to be traded, especially around market moving events. So, and uh, that's it. So don't forget to join us next time. Monday It's the next time. It's uh, Paul's turn again. So um, he's been away at the beginning of this month, but now he's back. And uh, on Monday at the same time, 3 p.m. Um, um, on German time. So it's 2 p.m. London, in fact. He talks about the trading dream versus uh, the reality what people expect. So this includes what people expect when they start trading. What's the dream? Um, it's usually become rich quick. Um, <laughs> that was probably also my motivation when I started trading, but I have to say uh, um, markets taught me to become more um, uh, down to earth, let's say. So, and uh, yeah, the question, what does the reality look like for most traders and how to find your own trading dream? In fact, that's how to, or to what it all comes down, in fact. So 2 p.m. London, Monday, the 3rd of March. I'm sorry, it's the 2nd of March. I'm sorry, it's not the 3rd, it's the 2nd because this February has 29 days. Um, and yeah, check your inbox for the webinar link. Uh, and if you watch this on YouTube, I mentioned it several times, then feel free to go to atmarmarkets.com, education, and there the webinars tab to register for all webinars. Also here for the Trading Spotlights webinar series. Atmarmarkets.com is the website. Here's uh, the contact details and fully regulated broker has to put a uh, risk disclaimer at the end. That's it for my end. So all the best and uh, talk to you again next week. I hope you enjoyed what, you, uh, what, I, what I presented to you. Have a nice weekend. Enjoy yourself. Talk to you. See you and bye-bye.